Okay, great to be here. I just got here today. Um, so if anyone wanted to talk to me, I'll be around today and tomorrow. It's fantastic to be here. I've missed Julia Khan very much. Um, okay, so um, I want to tell you a little bit about optimization in Julia, and I want to do it through the lens of thinking about types, thinking about what is the right type to write an optimization problem in? What is an optimization problem anyway? Um, so I'm going to be talking about this. This is my perspective on the problem. But I also want to tell you a little bit about actual packages that you can use to solve optimization problems. So it's a little bit of a hybrid talk. Um, but uh, OK, bear with me. OK, so I study optimization. So what does that mean? Um, it means if you give me a function, I should be able to find you its minimum. OK, so, um, so here's a function. Right? So, so how would you find the minimum of this function? <laughs> okay, so we've got the asking me method, we've got the gradient descent method. You would try to find the minimum of the gradient. Okay, uh, but this is a picture. This is a picture of a function. You could just point to it. Okay, so, so, um, okay, so w the, um, OK, so, so OK, let's keep thinking about this. But first, why should we optimize functions? What kind of functions should we optimize? OK, so you might be doing this to fit a model to data, uh, maybe under understanding customer preference. You might be trying to make predictions, maybe maximize revenue, maximize your investment returns, design a control system. So optimization, uh, uh, mathematical optimization occurs everywhere. Um, and uh, here, I'm gonna, when I say optimization, I'm going to mean mathematical optimization and not um, uh, compiler optimization, which, which the last talk was about to some extent. So maybe it's confusing. OK, so how do we find the minimum of this function? Um, OK, so we've heard a lot of methods. Um, we, could, we could try to set the derivative to 0 and solve analytically um, if we had an analytical formula. Um, we could use gradient descent. Um, um, if we could compute gradients, right, if the function were differentiable, uh, we could use other fancy optimization methods, which I'm not going to talk about in this talk, but where they apply, and they apply in some cases and not others. Um, and then there's the, the method of pointing to the minimum, right? See the function, you can point to its minimum, right? Okay, and, and you know, that's, I can use that if I can plot the function in two or three dimensions. Okay, so, so, so what's the big picture? Um, it's that, Depending on how you give me the function, I have to do something different in order to optimize it. Okay, so the key question for an optimizer like me is how are you going to give me the function? Okay, so um, here's an example of, of where I think mathematics, um, the language of, that you sort of write down mathematics in and that they teach you in high school or college, I think gets it wrong in terms of how the function should be given to you. Okay, so, so what is what, what, this expression? What does this mean? OK, so I'm hearing people saying two, which is a, it's a, it's a, it's a good answer. Um, uh, uh, it's a pretty good answer. Um, but what I would say is what it is is bad notation. <laughs> OK, so why do I think this is bad notation? x appears three times in that formula, and it means three different things. And that's weird, right? So on the one hand, x is the square function, OK? x squared. On the other hand, I've got this ddx thing, which is an operator that takes one function, x squared, and returns another function, its derivative, 2x. Okay, so the x is there, like, how, are they the same x? Or are they, what, what, is, what are these x's? And then there's this third x, which says um, at x equals 1. So it says evaluate the function at the argument 1. Okay, but if I do the things in the wrong order, like maybe if I plugged in the like, I, I, I plugged in 1 for x everywhere, I would get nonsense, right? What if I plugged in 1 to the ddx and I got dd1? <laughs> okay, so, so I would actually claim this is, this is just bad notation. So, um, so let's think about what, what does it mean to give someone a function, right? So you could give them a plot. Um, you could give them what I'm going to call an oracle. So um, here I'm saying I could define this function. It's a function of f, x squared. And I can evaluate that function at 1. I can evaluate that function at 2. And I get the right answer, the square of those numbers. Okay? But I could also give that person a function as a, as a type. So here I'm defining a type square. This is the square function. Um, OK, so I can define f to be the square, an instance of the square function. That's my function f. And I can define what it means to evaluate the square function, right? which is just x squared. Um, so, so why might I prefer doing that? Um, OK, and here's where I'm going to go to, um, here we go. Here I'm going to go to a, a notebook that I hope is large enough that you can read. 
Okay, so here's my the Oracle version of these functions f. Um, and here's, uh, here's the, the version where I define a type that's going to be the norm squared type. This is the norm squared thing, and I can define what it means to evaluate norm squared. Right? And it get, gives the right answers. Norm squared of 1 is 1. Norm squared of 2 is 4. Um, and I can even, so here's what's nice. I can even do things like norm squared of norm squared is 16. OK, so that's good. It's doing all the right things. Now, why should I bother defining a type? Well, now I can define other things that I might want to know about this function. Right? I might want to know not just the function values, but maybe I want to know its gradient. So now I can define the gradient of a norm squared thing. And it tells me how to compute the gradients of things that are like norm squared things. Okay? And so now I can compute the gradient, the gradient of the norm squared at 1, the gradient of the norm squared function at 2. Um, and you'll notice that there are no uh, dummy variables appearing here. Right? I've got a gradient, I've got the function, and I've got the value of the function. Okay, so this is a, another way of thinking about functions where I can, I can specify the same thing. This is, you know, ddx of f of x at x equals 2 only without all the x's. Um, and I actually think that's a more coherent way of thinking about what's going on. Okay, so how does this relate to um, optimization in Julia? That's, this is all motivation. Okay, so, um, okay, so we just did the optimization. So what's the moral? The moral is I think a function is a type. It's a type on which various operations are defined. And for me, it's a thing that I can use to solve optimization problems. So the operations that I need are the operations that I need to solve optimization problems. Okay? The advantages of this view is that it's, it's easy to understand what's going on. It's easy to reuse code because I can take the same types that someone else used for their optimization package, and I can define my own methods on them that are the methods that I need to solve my optimization problems. Um, so it's easy to extend this by adding new methods. Okay, so these are reasons why I, I, I like this, uh, this view of a function as a type. And, you know, okay, I'm not going to say too much. Okay, so, uh, but what is an optimization problem? So normally when I think of an optimization problem, uh, uh, many people think of the nonlinear form. So I'm going to minimize some function subject to some constraints. Um, both inequality constraints and equality constraints. And maybe I'll also say that I want my variable x to be inside some set c. Okay, so here x is my variable, um, and I've got an objective, inequality constraints, equality constraints, and a domain for my variable. Okay, so the advantage of this form is it's pretty easy to formulate your problem. Usually when you have an optimization problem, it is not too hard to write it down in this form. Okay, um, that's not always the form that solvers want to take, because they might want to know more about these functions, right? And here, I just said functions, f0, f1, f, you know, f, 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 f1 through m, h1 through uh, hm2. Like, what are these functions? How, how, how are you telling me about these functions? Are you giving me a graph? Are you giving me their values? Are you giving me their derivative? Like, what are you telling me about these functions? And that's going to matter to me as a solver when I try to figure out how to solve this problem. Okay, so as, as like, you know, people who program, we, we want more than this. Okay, so how should we solve this problem, right? Well, it depends what we know about the functions. Okay, um, so what are useful kinds of structure? There are a bunch of useful kinds of structure. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about that. So, uh, but that's what matters. Okay, so the model is gonna specify the structure and the solvers will exploit the structure to solve the problem. Um, so in Julia, we have a really robust ecosystem for, 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 for solving this kind of problem using this kind of framework. So we've got a bunch of modeling languages. Um, two of the, uh, uh, the biggest ones are, are convex and jump. Um, we've got glue, math prog base, which connects these modeling languages to solvers. And right now, I would say that Julia has the most robust ecosystem for mathematical optimization of any programming language. So we have connections to more solvers, and it's easier for you to move between different solvers as the problem that you're solving changes. Maybe you add a component to your problem, and suddenly it's no longer a linear program. Suddenly it's a second-order cone program, or it's a semi-definite program, or you add integer variables. It's very easy to change between these structures in Julia because of this nice uh, uh, framework where we have modeling languages, they go through some glue layer, and the glue layer is what talks to the solvers. Okay, so this, this makes uh, Julia a very powerful language for optimization. Okay, so um, very briefly about w what are these, what are these uh, modeling languages like? They're, they're, they're basically two approaches. So in jump, uh, I would say the user basically specifies the structure. In convex, the, solver, the, the, the modeling language detects the structure. 
so it infers the structure from whatever you type. Okay. Um, so more differences between jump and convex. But in this talk, I want to tell you a little bit about how convex works and how to use it, because I've worked much more on convex than jump. I just want you to be aware of jump, because it is an amazing and beautiful framework for optimization. And if you know more about your structure and you want to, um, you want to tell the solver more details about it, then that's the, uh, the framework you want to use. OK, so let me show you how convex works by going back over here. OK. Um, by the way, uh, both of these, uh, all of the stuff that you're seeing is available on my uh, GitHub in the um, JulieCon17 repository. OK, so um, okay, so how do we use convex? Well, first we should do using convex. Um, we can define a variable, say x is a variable, and this would define a scalar variable. We could define a, a, a vector variable. and um, Convex does fo follows the, the linear algebraic convection, so it, it, it really does use type one vectors if we're using Jauhaus language. So these are, these are column vectors, okay? So which is different from how the rest of Julia works, which is a little bit strange now. Okay, so maybe PR is accepted. Okay, um, okay, we can define matrix variables. So this is a four by two matrix. And we can even define complex variables, which Ayush gave a wonderful talk on yesterday, okay? Um, okay, what's an expression? An expression, it, well, it's a thing that you form by applying a function to a variable to form an expression. Okay, so um, here's a, an expression that I get by indexing one variable and, and adding it to two times another variable. Okay, and you see this is forming a thing. It's a, some kind of abstract expression. Its top level representation is it's a plus, okay? Um, and I know some things about it. Like I know it's sign and I know it's vexity, whatever that means. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna learn. Okay. Okay. So expressions. So they can be affine, convex, or concave. So for example, here's an expression. Its head is um, the geometric mean. So square root turned into something that's represented with geometric mean. Um, it's uh, positive and it's concave, which is true, right? Square root is a, a concave function. Okay. Um, there are lots of built-in functions for these convex variables. So I can do indexing. I can do uh, two norms, one norms, infinity norms, many kinds of norms. I can take the positive part of x. I can take the maximum, the absolute value. Um, in fact, I can take much more complicated things. I can take the log determinant of a matrix variable. I can take x. I can take logs. I can take, um, okay, mo most, in fact, everything that anyone has asked for so far. Um, so if you want to ask for another thing, please let me know, as long as that thing is representable as a, a convex function. Okay. Um, so, so um, but we could also add things together and get warnings, okay? So this warning says the expression is not DCB compliant and it may lead to unexpected behavior. So when you see this warning, it says, you should not be solving this problem using convex because we don't know how to understand your problem as convex. Um, okay, we can make constraints. So we can set, um, we can say, I want A times Y to be equal to B, and I'm gonna make that a constraint, my constraint one. I can make inequality constraints, rather as you would expect. And once again, we're spitting out some information about them. Um, and uh, okay, so, and every constraint is being parsed to verify convexity. So this is saying the, the vexity of the constraint is that this is a convex constraint. It represents a convex set. Okay, but I can also make, I could write down things that were not convex and it would give me the same warning. But it's, it can't figure out if this is a convex constraint or not. Okay. Um, okay, and then I can make optimization problems out of all these parts. So I can define my objective function, right, which is just an expression. I can define a constraint, which is a constraint, and I can say please minimize this objective subject to this constraint. Okay, so once I've got a problem, I can say please solve that problem and then tell me, tell me about P. Okay, so now it's calling a solver. Notice, okay, so, so this is not convex solving the problem. This is a solver solving the problem. Convex has done something to tell the solver what the problem consists of. The solver is gonna solve it, it's gonna do some stuff. Um, and at the end, it's going to tell me that it has solved it and the status is optimal. It has solved it to optimality. And so I can ask for the optimal value, which in this case is one half. I can evaluate the objective so it tells me what the value of the objective is now that all the variables have, I, I know what their values are, I've solved the problem. And I can see the value of the variable, x dot value. Um, in fact, I can even see things like the dual variables. Um, but I'm not gonna tell you enough about optimization for you to 
know what that, okay, but if you, if you already know what dual variables are, you might be very excited. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, okay, so, um, so, 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 so that's, that's, that's how to use convex, okay, but what, what is convex? So I think of it as a framework for detecting and exploiting structure in optimization problems. Okay, so what, what properties of functions does convex use, right? We just said, you know, so what are we telling convex about these functions, right? Um, well, what convex needs to know is it needs to know how to evaluate the functions, how to verify the convexity of the functions, and how to compute the conic form of these optimization problems. Um, so convex is interfacing right now with conic form solvers. And so it's taking a problem, it's turning into this form that's called conic form, and it's passing it to the solver that way. And I'm going to sort of show you how that works um, now. Okay, so uh, let's see how this works. Okay, so um, behind the scenes, what are these expressions? Okay, the, using prefix notation, um, we're, we're really just building up uh, an abstract syntax tree representation of these expressions. So if I say x plus y, it knows it's the plus of x and y. If I say x of one plus x of two, it's the plus of the indexing operator of x and one and the indexing operator of x and two. Okay, so, so this is what behind the scene convex is constructing as you type in your expressions. Okay, so every composite expression has a head, it's a top level operation, and then a possibly empty list of children. Okay, so to evaluate an expression, how do I evaluate expressions using this um, syntax tree representation? Well, I apply the top level value function to the value of the argument. So for example, if the top level um, expression is abs, then I, to evaluate that expression, I evaluate the abs absolute value function on whatever the value of its children is. Okay, so, so, so this, this sort of recursively walks down the tree and I get the value of the expression, assuming that the variables have values. Okay, so. I've got some representation like this of my problem. Um, okay, so I, I, I know how to walk this whole structure. And the question is, can I figure out the things I need to know from this tree? Can I figure out whether the expression is convex? And can I figure out the, the conic form of the problem so I can give it to solvers? Okay, so um, we use induction and recursion to move from these properties of variables, constants, and functions, which are the leaves and the nodes in this tree, to properties of the expressions, the constraints, and the problem itself. So, um, okay, so how do we detect convexity? So now I'm finally, finally, 20 minutes in my talk, going to tell you what convexity is. Uh, okay, which is, because this is the, because this, this was a talk about thinking about the structure of functions, about what we know about functions, and only now am I getting to the particular things that convex wants to know about functions, which are, it's convexity, as you might expect from the name. Okay, so a function is convex if, if when you draw the graph of the function and you connect any two points on the graph of the function, the line, that line always lies above the function or at least it never lies below the function. Okay, so equivalently, the, gra the, the graph of f has upward curvature, okay? Um, and the graph of f never lies above its quartz. Okay, so that's a picture of a convex function. Okay, but we're not necessarily working with pictures because we might be in, in higher dimensions. So we can't just check convexity by drawing the picture. Okay, so um, disciplined convex programming is a framework for, um, that provides a set of inductive rules to verify convexity. Okay, so this is basically, it's the, it's the chain rule. That's all it is. Okay, so we say F composed with G is convex if F is convex and non-decreasing and G is convex or if f is convex not increasing g is concave. But, but essentially, all we're doing is checking the signs of all the, the things in the chain rule. So we're saying the second derivative of f composed with g is positive if, well, we know it's a sum of these two, two terms, which we know by writing down the chain rule. And if the first term is positive and the second term is positive, well, then their sum is positive. Okay, so it's very complicated um, uh, arithmetic on, on numbers. Okay, very complicated, okay. So um, similarly, okay, so we'll define that um, f composed with g is concave if it's negative is convex, and it's affine if it's both convex and concave, and that means we can basically deduce everything that we're going to deduce from this one simple rule, which is the chain rule, <laughs> okay? Um, okay, but what's nice is the chain rule gives us this recursive structure. So now we should be able to evaluate convexity recursively, right, if we know how to evaluate each of these things in the chain rule, right, whether each function is, is increasing and whether it's convex. So it's, we say the function is DZP if it's convexity or concavity, it can just be inferred from these composition rules. Okay. Um, okay, so what's the base case, right? If we're doing recursion, we need to define the base case. So the base case is that, well, constants are constant, 
and variables are affine. Okay, um, and the inductive rule. So for every function, we know what the curvature of the function is. So if it were just a function of a single variable, would it be convex or concave or affine? And we know if it's increasing, decreasing, or, or you know, wiggly. Okay. Um, okay, so then we, we just use the chain rule to figure out if it's convex. Okay, what about constraints? Well, we just check your left hand and right hand side and, and make sure that both sides define convex sets, then you're good. Um, and problems check their convexity by verifying that the objective and the constraints are all convex. Okay, so then you're good. Okay, so what's cool is that you can impl implement this DCP rule in Julia um, as, as one simple function using arithmetic on vexities and monotonicities if you, if you uh, implement it correctly. Um, so since I'm going very fast, I'm going to continue going fast and uh, uh, not explain this. Um, but, but the way that convex works under the hood is we, we, we define arithmetic convexities and this is how we figure out if your expression is convex. And this is literally the same thing you would do just looking at the chain rule. Okay. Um, so now you're supposed to see this in action. Okay. So here's convexity inference. Um, okay. So for example, square of the positive part of X. Okay. Well, square is convex and increasing when its argument is positive, and the positive part of x is certainly always positive, and it's convex, so this thing is convex, okay? Um, the inverse of the positive part of the square root of x, okay? Well, the inverse of, of a positive thing, that's convex, and it's decreasing. Square root of x is concave, and it's increasing. Okay, so by these rules, I compose them, I get something that is convex, and indeed, the package seems to be working, which is, which is good because I told you it's usable and, and you should, okay. So it is working. Um, okay, F is convex-cave increasing and G is concave. So square root of square root of X. Okay, and indeed it's still, um, I can tell that this expression has a concave vexity. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, but not every convex expression is DCP compliant. So for example, square root of square of X, what's that? X, X okay. Um, and is it convex? Yes, it's affine. Okay, but we can't tell that because we couldn't infer that from the chain rule. Okay, so we'd have to implement some special parsing for that and, and we don't because that makes it confusing for users. So now you, you know the rule. If you can infer convexity from the chain rule, then you can use convex. If you can't infer convexity from the chain rule, then convex is not the package for you. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So now we, we, we know how to infer convexity. Okay. Um, so I told you there's one other ingredient that we need to be able to actually pass these problems to solvers, which is we need to be able to infer the conic form of a problem. Okay, so what, what is the conic form of a problem? So um, we say a problem's in conic form if you can write in this super simple form, minimize a linear function of x subject to another linear function of x is in some cone, k. Um, and k just has to be a convex cone. Um, that means if you multiply, if, if, if you've got any vector that's in the cone, you multiply it by a positive scalar, it stays in the cone. That's what it means to be a convex cone. And there are lots of examples of cones. For example, zero is a convex cone. Um, the positive orthant, all of the, the non-negative vectors are uh, uh, that form a, uh, form a cone. Um, second order cone, which is sometimes called the ice cream cone. So anything that fits inside your ice cream cone, if your ice cream cone went off to infinity, um, that would be a convex cone. Okay, which is the, the best kind of ice cream cone. Um, okay, and any product of these cones is also a, a convex cone. Okay, so we'd like to be able to get our problems in convex. So, 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 so why is this a useful form? Why do solvers like to target it? And essentially it's because you know everything. Once I tell you the conic form of your problem, you know everything. Because you know everything there is to know about ice cream cones and zero cones and positive orthants. You know what C is, you know what B is, you know what A is. Right? So rather than saying, oh, my function, having to describe it by saying, oh, it wiggles like this, or you know, here's the, the gradient at every point, right? I know everything there is to know by specifying these four things. Okay? And that's really powerful for solvers. It means they can exploit a lot of structure. So it might be surprising that you can write down all of these, all of these problems that you've seen so far, all of these expressions you've seen so far. You can write them down in conic form. Um, and, and it's often hard. It, it, so interesting fact number one, it's possible to do so. Um, interesting fact number two, convex can do it for you, so you don't have to think about how to take your problem and turn it into this conic form. Okay, so that's, that's what's pretty powerful about, about convex. So um, why would you do this? Right, it allows these solvers to efficiently grok the structure of your problem um, and leads to fast solvers. Okay. Um, 
I'm not going to tell you how it works because we're already behind schedule, but it's in my slides and it's also kind of in uh, a Julia Kahn presentation that I gave um, some number of years ago and it's in a paper, so if you, and you can talk to me. Okay, because I think it's pretty cool. Okay, so here's the recursive way of defining conic form. I have five whole minutes, this is great. Okay, okay, so, um, okay. So, so this is a coda for, 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 you know, that I can talk about at JuliaCon and nowhere else. Because, so, so what have we done here? Is Convex just reproducing the compiler, right? Because I told you what we do is we form this abstract syntax tree for the problem, right? And then we navigate this abstract syntax tree, we, we go up and down it in order to determine properties of our, func of our, of our problem, right? Determining its convexity, getting it into conic form. Um, okay, so, um, I'd say, yeah, we are kind of making our own compiler, um, but I'm not sure that's a problem. I think that's okay. Um, and, and the reason for that is that, that I think this is one of the beauties of Julia, is that the type system plus multiple dispatch makes it really easy for me to write my own compiler for convex problems. Um, that means I can simulate a compiler without understanding Julia's own compiler. Okay, so this makes it very easy for me to write this kind of code. It also makes it pretty easy for other people to inspect my code and understand what's going on. It makes it very easy to extend because everything is sort of wrapped in these types. Um, and so if I want to add, say, a, um, a new way of parsing conic problems, or parsing, parsing these optimization problems that's not just turning them into conic problems, it's very easy to add that on top of convex um, and, and, and people have. Um, okay, so that's pretty cool is that, that because I'm doing this at this um, sort of like simulating a compiler strategy, uh, it actually makes it easy for people to play with. You can't get in too much trouble. Okay, but other packages do take very different approaches. So for example, jump, um, which is the other major modeling system um, for optimization problems in Julia, um, uses macros to capture the AST. So whereas in convex you say variable constraint problem and jump you say at variable, at constraint, at problem. Okay, because they're, 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 they're doing some stuff behind the scenes. So on the one hand that makes them really fast, on the other hand it's a little bit less friendly. Okay, so there are advantages and disadvantages. Okay, but this is what's really cool, is the, the coolest way to do this is to use the Julia compiler uh, in order to make the abstract syntax tree and walk it and figure out what's going on. And so now I want to show you my, like, the coolest way of, of uh, writing down functions and gradients in Julia. Okay, so this is using the, the forward diff. Okay, so this is, this is um, um, automatic differentiation as implemented in the forward diff model. Okay, so once again I'm using the same f that I did before, which was just square, norm, norm of x squared. Okay, so that's my function f, and that's just written in Julia code. So I can say, compute the gradient of that at the point one, compute the gradient of that at the point two, and compute the gradient of, of f of f of x. Okay, and it's doing the right thing, two, four, 32. Okay, so that's really cool, but on the other hand, I don't fully understand how it works. <laughs> it's really cool though, okay. Um, now, whether you can do that, for example, to, so we, that works for gradients. I don't know how to do that for conic form, I don't know how to use that, do that for a lot of other sort of primitives that you might want to use inside optimization algorithms like proxes or, um, okay, but, but for gradients it's actually kind of amazing. Okay. Okay, so um, I claim Julia is the right language for mathematical programming um, because it's easy to, to make the following uh, definitions. A function is a type on which various operations are defined which can be used to solve optimization problems. Okay, so that's, that's claim number one. Claim number two is that um, you should use Julia for optimization for mathematical programming because we've got a tremendous ecosystem of optimization software, software at this point um, and, and it can be, uh, okay, so, so you should use it. Great. Um, okay, so there's lots more information in code. Um, uh, the Julia opt organization curates information. Convex has lots of documentation, lots of examples. Um, and in my abstract, I claimed I would also talk about low rank models, um, but I'm not going to. On the other hand, um, Mihir Paradkar is going to give a talk on low rank models this afternoon. So um, you can still learn lots about them. Um, and I am now officially out of time. Thank you. <laughs>